Welcome to the custom sawing site layout and pricing seminar. I hope that's the one everybody's wanting to be at. This is seminar number six. Um, my name is Jim Brown. Uh, for those of you that were in the earlier seminar, uh, I've been with Wood Miser since May of 1983, and uh, so it's a little over 20, 24 years. And uh, this seminar here, basically, we want to talk about different types of site layouts, tips in how to get the most production that you can out of your sawmill. And then the second half of it, we'll talk about pricing for your services or how to charge or different ways of charging for your services. No matter how your site layout is laid out, the, the job of sawing lumber is, is hard work. I don't know if your salesman told you that when you bought your mill or not, but uh, I have to, to freely state that up front. It's hard work, no matter which way you do it. But we want to try to do it the easiest way, so we'll go through a few, uh, few things here that uh, hopefully will help you uh, in that area. Hopefully you'll get a tidbit somewhere. This is site layout one. It's my favorite site layout if I don't have an edger. Okay, My favorite site layout is always with an edger. I hate edging on a sawmill and I know uh, the reason I know that is because I do shows and I get to do it with an edger and I get to do it without. And It's, uh, it's a lot uh, easier. I think you can do a better job usually. Now the sawmill does a great job of edging. It's just a little more difficult. But if I don't have an edger, this is my, my favorite layout. Uh, but as you see here, I just want to mention a few things. Uh, it's always good to have your logs on runners up off the ground. Uh, that way you're not picking up rock or dirt. Uh, they're easier to maneuver as well. So you see the runners under the logs. Uh, you also notice that the logs are centered to the log deck of the mill. Now these are eight foot logs here that we show in the picture. If you had variable lengths of logs, you wouldn't want one end of the logs to be the same. You'd want to split the difference. So always try to center your log to the log deck of the mill. The second thing you see is on the top, or top side of the mill here is saw horses. Uh, as mentioned in the earlier session I've done, these saw horses that we use are, are made out of steel, but you want a heavy duty saw horse where you can stack several flitches on there. I'd say at least four feet in width. Uh, the second thing is, is your, your finished lumber pile. Uh, if you're sawing, you want to size up the job. How big is this job and how often is my material going to be moved? So if you've got 20 logs to saw and there's no forklift around to move the lumber once you've got it stacked up, you don't want to start with your lumber uh, stacking here close to the mill. You want to work, uh, start away from the mill and estimate and work yourself towards the mill. So as the day goes long and you're tired or you're not walking as far as far, uh, to get the lumber stack. So you'd start down here and work your way back to the mill. The slab pile, uh, the one thing I would say about a slab pile, we have those on runners as well. Uh, try to keep your slabs stacked in the same direction. I know it's difficult, we've all done it to where when you're edging lumber, that's the most difficult time because you got some edges are solid and you're carrying them just fine and you got two or three that's kind of weak in the middle and they're drooping down and dragging behind you and then you can fling them on the pile and all of a sudden your your flitches or your edges excuse me are, are not stacked properly and and your pile will build up on you a lot faster if you let that happen so try to keep them in the same mode so that towards the end of the day you're not having to throw your slabs so high if you're if you're going to be done at the end of the day or whatever the end of that job is, you want to have a path to get your mill out of there. If the guy's not going to move your lumber, you don't want to you want to have a way to to get your sawmill hooked up to your vehicle and, and get out and go on to the next job. You don't want to be held hostage there. Uh, just want to mention a few a few tips about stacking lumber. Uh, Typically, it's pretty important to stack by thickness. Um, if you try stacking four-quarter lumber and eight-quarter lumber together or any other multiple thicknesses, it's very difficult, obviously, to keep your pile looking very well. So typically, you'll stack by thickness in different piles if, you, if you're cutting different thicknesses. Stacking by length is optional. Uh, stacking by species is, is pretty much optional, except for when you're grade sawing and or if it's a customer preference, he may want them stacked separately. Sticker stacking, if you're going to sticker stack the lumber, you want to get the bottom rung up off the ground, preferably eight inches or more. Um, your stickers need to be evenly spaced. 
and uh, if sticker clear out to the end of your boards as best you can. Some guys will double sticker each end because what happens is when air penetrates the end of your boards, you, you, you'll get shrinkage quicker and you'll develop a crack. That crack will generally stop at the where the stickers are. So if you're stickered eight inches in from the end, it's going to crack clear to the sticker a lot of times. So that's the reason you want to sticker stack. The other important thing about sticker stacking is you want to you want to bring those stickers straight up from each other. You don't want to have one sticker position, you know, six or eight inches away, and the next one next row up is six or eight inches the other way. You keep those straight on top of each other. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, what I want to do here is go through a few of the what I call tips and teamwork. And those of you that was in the session two that I did, we talked about sawing and having an ideal setup, uh, easy to cut species of wood. Well, these video clips that you see short clips of here are going to be from those case studies we did in that other session. One of the things is the tips and teamwork is the off bear, uh, you want him to get the next log ready to go onto the mill while the first log is being finished up. Now, one thing I do want to point out here, you never want to get into that area when that log's still in the round form. Wait till he's got at least two sides of it squared up so if something happened, it can't roll back off and endanger somebody. If you got loading arms, if you're a hydraulic mill and you have loading arms on the mill, always keep your loading arms halfway up so that if something happened in the turning process or whatever you're doing, clamping, the log can't come back off the mill. Uh, but in this session, you'll, you're going to see just a few seconds of clips. Sometimes it's a little bit difficult to see what they're doing, but I'll try to explain those before I, I do the, uh, the clip. In this situation here, we've talked about saw horses. You can, can barely see this. There's a board, whitish looking thing on sitting on the saw horse back there against the wall. There's some lumber there. This is the second log in the cutting process I think we're doing. And you see on the mill, we've got a cant of about four inches thick. So we're squared up, and this guy, the off bear, as a good team player, he's got the next log already cable on it, hooked to the mill, and, and he's got it partially winched up the loading arm. So this, these kind of tips here can increase your production. So we'll watch the video. He's got one or two more cuts to make. This guy's going to get that log as close to the bottom, the top of the log as close to the bottom of the deck as he can. So as soon as those, that, those few boards come off of there, then just a few more cranks to the winch, the next log's on, they're going to get it clamped in and go. Edging lumber on a manual mill. How many of you out there have manual mills? Okay. Several of you? Okay. Good. Uh, this is uh, a tip that I, I learned actually in Central America from one of our New York branch guys. So you can pick up information at the strangest places. What we're doing here is if you see in the behind the mill there, you see a bunch of lumber stacked up. So we're in the edging. We're getting ready to go into the edging process. And what we've done here is we've taken a, the last cant before we said, okay, we've cut about four logs and we're going to edge now. And so instead of cutting that last log and taking the lumber off, we've left the cant on the bed of the mill. And so what we're doing here is we're going to take the flitches that need edge and we're going to put them back up and use that cant as the clamp. That'll save a ton of time. You know, who wants to run around there and clamp that in? Uh, we've tried to improve that clamp over the years, but the clamp we have really does work well. Uh, and it's, we just haven't found a good way to do that. So in this place, what we do, instead of having to use the clamp, we just slide that out, put the flitches in, slide it back, and then we take our cut, flip them over, slide it back again. And the thickness of that cant will be determined by how tall of material you're edging. Uh, if it's really tall, you'll want to leave a little bit thicker, thicker cant. Now, this is a cant. You can go ahead and slice that cant up into boards, just leave them on the mill and use four boards instead of a four, four and a half inch wide cant. Just use individual boards stacked on top of each other. They both work. So we'll watch this little clip here and you'll see that he uses that cant as his clamp. He 
just slide the can over, that'll hold it in place. It doesn't have to clamp it with a metal clamp at all. No edge of the lumber. Uh, raising the head while turning the log. This one's a little bit hard to see. Now we're on a hydraulic mill. Uh, we've got two sides of it cut and uh, so you watch as he knows he's cut down a few cuts into that log and so now what he's going to do is he's going to turn it he knows he's got to raise it probably three or four or five inches so while he's actually turning he's got his left hand on the up down control and is raising the head uh, like I said these are just little small tips that can make a difference in a, in a day's time so he's turning, he's got his left hand on the drum switch there, the, and uh, he's raising the head to position it while he's turning the log. Another tip, uh, the off bear getting the next log into the loading arms, we're squared up. So you see the off bear in this one, positioning the log in the loading arms. And while he's cutting, any time the operator runs that head back onto that strip, if the off bear's there, he can start raising that log up and getting it ready to go onto the mill. Okay, the off bear helped turn his small logs and cans uh, when available. Um, th those of you that have hydraulic mills, uh, this is something that can be done if you have a really good off bear. Occasionally he'll be free to actually flip the cant rather than you have to turn it. If you've got a super series mill, the hydraulics are so fast, most of the time you can't do this faster. But in the case of a standard hydraulic mill, if the off bear is not really doing anything at some points, he can actually flip the cant for you. And it can increase your production. You'll see him do that here. So he's unclamped it. The off bear is just going to grab it and flip it a couple of turns. The operator clamps it back in and they're ready to go. Okay, now another tip is, uh, you'll see in this little clip, is the op operator um, disengages his blade at the end of the cut, so when he comes back about two feet before he gets to the end of the log, he's going to engage the blade so that once he clears the end, all he has to do is let it down and go in again. If you've got a super series mill and your operator, or off bear I mean, is behind you, um, 8, 10, 12 foot material, a lot of times you just leave the blade running. Uh, but a standard hydraulic mill, you know, you could do the same on eight foot material, but if it gets very long, you'd probably want to disengage it uh, and then come back. So that's what he's doing here. He's got a, uh, I think that's an eight foot, maybe 12 foot material there. It's eight or 12 foot, so he's disengaging the blade when he gets to the end of the cut. And so rather than take a little bit of his time when it comes back, he's engaging. So when it gets clear, then he's dropping down and taking the next cut. Uh, edging from saw horses, there's a lot of advantages. If I'm edging an individual log uh, because of its size, it's, it's big enough that I don't want to put, I don't want to get it off the mill and back on, so I'm just going to edge the lumber one log at a time. Uh, I always try to get the widest flitches on the clamp side. So if I've got my loading arms full, I'll get them up there where I can get them on the mill, and if it's real wide, I'll just leave it laying flat. If it's narrower, I'll stand it up against the side supports and I'll try to put them on that way. So once I have them on there and I get them all stood up to edge, I'm usually working from a narrower towards the side supports and wider as I go out. That way when I cl clean up one or two on the outside, it's easy to unclamp, flip those two, and go on. Uh, I, I don't like having to dig in the middle of a pile of boards, pull one out, and turn it over, and stand it back down in there. So if you put the widest ones on the outside, that's if you're doing individual log, that's a very good way to do it. In this case, what we've done is we've sawed a couple of logs. We've got quite a few flitches on our saw horses, but when we put them on the saw horses, we sort stack them. So we take the wider ones and say, who this is wide, I put it right next to the sawmill. Then if it's a little bit narrower, I'll put it one row further away, and then the real narrow I'll put on further in yet. So when I get ready to put them back on the mill, I've got several flitches that are very similar in sizes as you'll see here. Uh, edging on the mill is, is, a, is a lot of hard work, and anything you could do there to make it, make it easier on yourself. Uh, certainly it's beneficial.
to your production and uh, your physical well-being at the end of the day. Uh, the last tips and teamwork uh, is off bear. In this situation here, we've got a mill. We're dragging back the boards uh, for the off bear, and he's feeding through the edger. If your um, edger man is bundling up lumber or bundling up slabs, uh, the off bear has the option just instead of feeding it through the edger, he can stack it himself. Anytime the edger man's free and available, even if the board doesn't need edged, he can feed it through, just open up the blades and feed it through, and then the guy can stack it. But in this case, the edger guy's getting behind or tied up with something else, so he's just going to carry it straight to the, the, the pile of lumber. So there's several little tips, hopefully, that can help you in your production. Um, uh, like I said in the earlier session, you know, every little, th it's a game of inches really. And if you want to increase your production, you got to look uh, specifically in the area of how you handle your material. Because the majority of your day will be spent loading, turning, leveling, and clamping your logs. Um, so anything you can do to make that process or improve that is going to give you the best chance of uh, increasing your production. Uh, if you're stationary and uh, or you got big jobs to go to, certainly an edger is a huge way to just bump your production about 30 percent. But uh, if you're just looking for your portable and you're doing smaller jobs and you just want little tidbits of how I can improve my production, I think hopefully there's some tips there that can help you. Next we'll talk about some site layouts. Uh, told you earlier my favorite one without an edger we've seen. This is my favorite site layout with an edger. Uh, so it would make it my favorite site layout. Uh, your logs centered again to the mill. Uh, your lumber in this one with when you have an edger, the off bear from the sawmill can take finished lumber and start his day, depending on the job size, but start his day with a middle stack here and work his way back towards the logs pile. The edgerman the guy that's operating or tailing off the edger can start his stack in the middle and work his way out towards the end of the edger. Uh, very nice layout, uh, works very well. Slabs can all be stacked on the opposite side of the edger. Uh, again, we've talked about how to keep those fairly neat and hopefully you can do that and keep that pile from getting any bigger than it needs to. I have a couple more layouts. These are layouts that are possible. But here we have the edger coming off the end of the mill again. And we've put the lumber uh, on this side. Again, your off bear from the mill can stack here. Your off bear from the edger can stack and can work his way this way. And we've actually stacked the flitches and the, or, and the slabs uh, trimmings uh, on the other side here. So basically just a, you know, if ha something happened to be in your site layout that made it better to put the lumber one place or the other, you could do that. Uh, if you're short on space, lengthwise, you could turn your edger 90 degrees uh, to the mill, and uh, at that point, the off bear could stack his lumber again up to the top of the screen there, and the edgerman can stack his finished lumber this way and work his way back towards where he's basically going to be operating from. All the slabs and flitches can come down here to the other side of the edger. So a few different site layouts, like I said, uh, handling your material as efficiently as possible. Uh, not taking any more steps than you have to take is, is a key to obviously doing it uh, without wearing yourself out any more than you're going to and as efficiently as possible to keep your production up. So, Any questions on that part of the, the seminar? We're going to get ready to go into the pricing options, uh, how to charge for your services. No questions? Okay, let's go into pricing options then. Uh, what I want to do here is basically discuss um, the disadvantages of a, how to charge uh, a method. What's the disadvantage of this particular method and what the next would be what are the advantages of it. Because each, each method of how you charge has pros and cons so to speak. So, the first thing we'll do is, is by the hour. How many of you charge by the hour? Okay. Several of you, okay. And uh, how many uh, uh, charge by the hour and by the board foot, depending on the job or whatever? Okay, a few of you do that as well. Okay, 
So let's just go by the hour first. The disadvantages of charging by the hour is you may lose some jobs due to customers at risk, okay? Um, what I mean by that is in this day and age, if you're sawing out barn patterns for people or whatever you're doing, it's a, you know, they really don't know how good you are, how much you can produce, and so it's kind of an open-ended thing for them. They may be going to Lowe's or Menards, Home Depot, and getting a package saying, here's what you need to build a barn or pole barn or whatever, here's the material list, and they, you know, they're shocked at the price of lumber, so then they said, well, I got some, some timber, I'll just see what it costs me to do it myself. Well, if you charge by the hour, they really can't compare. So they don't know if it's going to be uh, beneficial or cost them even more. Obviously, they have to do some work if they're going to fell their own trees or have someone do that. So customer cannot compare uh, very well and uh, the possibility of, for you guys, the possibility of making less money is there. Now that could go either way. It could be an advantage or a disadvantage. Advantages of by the hour is you, for you, you have a known income. Uh, very little risk. You know, if you go out that day and you charge 50, 60, 70 dollars, whatever you charge per hour, uh, you're most likely going to going to get that kind of income for that day. Um, another big advantage of charging by the hour is you don't have to estimate the job in advance. You know, with the price of fuel today, you know, jumping from 250 to 350 a gallon, uh, uh, it's fairly expensive to go out and, and look at jobs ahead of time. I see smiles on your faces back there. Uh, you know, you take a big risk if, you, if you're sawing by the hour and you don't go out and uh, check the job out ahead of time, you can really get burnt. And uh, I can tell several of you have experienced that. You, the guy says he's got nice saw logs. You go out there and it should have been firewood. Uh, if you saw them by the hour, it doesn't matter to you. But if you saw by the board foot, it does. So that could be an advantage. You don't have to go out and, and estimate the job ahead of time or check it out. Uh, if you have less productive equipment, you might get more jobs. So if you're advertising in the paper and you're $40 an hour uh, and you've got a lower productive type sawmill and somebody else has got a lot more equipment, whether it be an edger, whether it be a, a larger sawmill uh, with hydraulics, etc. If you both advertise in the same paper and you're $40 an hour and this other guy's 80, who are you going to call? Probably going to call the guy at 40 bucks an hour. Uh, Depends on a lot of that. Kind of depends on your reputation. If you're in a small area and people know your work, then uh, may not be as much of a of, of an issue either way for you. You might get just as many jobs. So the other advantage of possibly by the hours, you could make more money. Uh, let me just state here for a moment: whether you, no matter how you charge for your services, it's critical that in your business for a long-term business that you, you you conduct yourself in a manner that's that's ethical that you can that you can make money but that you can give your customer a good deal as well uh, we talked about sticker stacking lumber earlier um, if you sticker stack lumber or if you if you just saw a bunch of lumber for a guy and you stack dead stack it which that's okay as long as the guy knows he can't just leave it there for months and it not ruin so Educate your customers, communicate with your customers is, is extremely important, no matter how you charge. Um, if you hit metal, you know, you need to tell them up front what that means. Now, if you're charging by the hour and you hit metal, it may mean they, they pay you for the pro price of a blade. Uh, I know several years ago, guys would say, well, if I hit metal, I'm going to have to resharpen the blade, so I'll charge him eight bucks or ten bucks. That's not fair to you. If you hit metal, you need to charge him the price of a new blade because number one, uh, it just takes it, it takes time. Of course, he's paying for it by the hour, and if you're sawing by the board foot, then you're losing money because you got to dig the blade out sometimes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You can't just sharpen a blade one time if you hit metal. Usually, you got to sharpen it two or three times. So, don't be afraid to charge him for the cost of a blade. And, and everybody knows, or shipping and handling on your blades, etc. So. You should be charging twenty, twenty-five dollars if you hit metal. Is basically what I what I feel. Charging by the hour, you know, the rates vary from thirty to ninety dollars an hour across the United States. 
I'd actually say in some cases they could probably go a little higher than that and probably do, especially the guys that have uh, you know, an edger or something with, with their sawmill. Uh, if you're cutting difficult wood, you know, or the setup and location, you know, allow for efficient material handling. Uh, you don't have to worry about it if you're charging by the hour. Uh, many owners use this method to require the customers to supply manpower. Uh, in today's uh, society, a lot of us, or a ton of you, I mean, you can raise your hand if you want, are out there sawing and you let the customer you're sawing for provide the manpower for you. So you see quite a few of you, you do that. Uh, so charge him by the hour, you don't really have to worry about how good he is. If he wants to supply two or three guys and keep the lumber away from you, etc., you're going to saw more, he's going to get his lumber sold at a lower price. I would say one thing for those of you that are charging by the hour, just check yourself and see how your production looks and see if I charged by the board foot, what would I have made that day. You may find you're cutting yourself way short by charging by the hour. I know there'll be good days and bad days. But just check that out and also check it out for the fairness of your customer uh, that he's not paying too much per board foot to get it sold uh, if you're sawing by the hour. Uh, this is something that's, that you used to hear a lot about. When I started at Wood Meisner in the early 80s, all we had was an LT30 sawmill. And obviously that was a manual mill. and. So the mills weren't out there in a high production type atmosphere trying to produce a lot of lumber. So a lot of hobbyists purchased the mills back then. And uh, a lot of times they'd go out and saw on a percentage, you know, for, and depending on the quality of the wood, the species of the wood, what that percentage would be. Uh, I, again, I would just caution you to be fair to your client as to if it's really high quality stuff, don't take as high percentage, just be fair. And uh, now, there are some disadvantages of sawing on the percentage because how do you separate the lumber? You know, one board for you, one board for me, or one log for you, one log for me. Uh, how does that work? I'll take all the outer boards, you get all the inner boards. Well, the highest quality lumber is on the outside. So you, we want to be fair, but how do you do that? It can be a little bit complicated. Uh, the other thing is, is you may have to handle the lumber more. You may have to store it, so that means you, if you're just getting paid for the services, you saw it up, you stack it up, and you're done. Now you're doing it on half. Now you got to take your lumber home, and if you if you're not going to use it right away, you got to stick or stack it, and you got to sell it. You got to find a, a market for it, etc. So there's it's not as heavily used today, I guess is what I'm saying, as it used to be. Advantages is it may be very high quality lumber and something that you're looking for or you've got a, a good market for. So it's just a method that was used uh, and is probably still used quite a bit today, but not nearly as much as some of the others. The next option I'd like to talk about is, is charging by the board foot. It's probably the most common uh, method of charging in the lumber industry. Uh, in the sawmill, portable sawmill industry it may not be, but in the lumber industry, uh, certainly the, the way most of lumber uh, is transacted. But the disadvantages of sawing by the board foot is your log size too small or too large can affect your production dramatically. Not every time you go to job sites is it going to be in that 16 to 24 inch perfect production sawing type species. So you have to take those into consideration. Uh, it may require an extra trip. We've already talked about that earlier. Uh, that can be very costly with the price of fuel today and time consuming. Uh, could possibly lose jobs to those unfamiliar with the terminology of board foot. Uh, this is probably, uh, to me, one of the most difficult things about the board foot terminology is it's like a foreign language to most people. I mean, I don't, how many times have you had to tell somebody what a board foot is? 12 inches wide, 12 inches long, but one inch thick. I see a lot of you out there, it's, it, you have to do it all the time. And to be honest, uh, I didn't, when I came to work for Wood Miser, I never heard of it before. You know, and the guy said it's 12 inches wide, 12 inches long by, by uh, one inch thick. And I'm thinking, well, what's a two by six, 12 foot long? I don't want a one inch by 12 inches. So uh, you can lose jobs because people are unfamiliar with that terminology. And uh, if you, somebody calls you up on the phone and wants you to solve for them, you say, I charge 25 cents a board foot. 
he may or may not ask what that is. And if he does ask and you give him the pat answer, that's not what he wants. So some people will hang in there with you until you get it explained and they'll understand it. I think the majority of people will not. Um, they'll just say, okay, thank you very much and hang up and go to the Lowe's or Menards and buy their lumber instead of letting you solve for them. So I think that's a big, that's a big quirk with me. I, I'm, I don't even do it for a living and I'm sick of explaining what a board foot is over the years. So I know a lot of you are as well. You also, a disadvantage is you need to consider the cutting location we talked about, you know, is it, is it level, you know, is it smooth where you can walk without spraining your ankle, things like that you have to really consider when you're sawing by the board foot so that you can get the production. And then the last there is need to consider the sawing, what type of sawing you're doing because uh, different techniques can take uh, different amounts of time. Now, the advantages of sawing by the board foot, like I said, it's the most common pricing method in the industry. So if people know what a board foot is uh, in your area of the country, then it's a very effective way. Customer pays a fixed rate per board foot. The more you cut, the more you make, the more you make, you know that old saying. I don't think that's quite where that's applied, but uh, that's, what I'll, that's another thing I like about it is the more you cut, the more you make. And you could possibly exceed any hourly rate that the customer would be willing to pay. Uh, when you saw by the board foot, you know what you're doing, and you've got the right log size, etc. You can make quite a bit of money. Most of the time, if any, when you're in those situations, you can make more money than you could if you just told the guy, "I'm charging you $100 an hour or 110." He may not pay that, but if you're charging him 25 cents a foot, and you make that, there should be no qualms. So. And then the customer, the other advantage is the customer only pays for what he gets. So there's some pretty good advantages of that. Uh, rates vary. Uh, I've been doing these seminars over the country uh, and into Canada now, and the rates pretty much, every once in a while you hear 18 cents a foot, but pretty much 20 cents a board foot seems to be the low. Uh, 40 cents a board foot's close to the high. I think we've heard some higher than that, but. That's a pretty good range of what we've seen. Uh, another thing you might want to clarify if you're cutting cedar and some other specialty woods that anything less than one inch would be considered one inch. You know, if you're cutting half inch, you still consider it one inch, or three quarter inch, you still consider it one inch. Um, this next one is very similar, the advantages. Uh, this does kind of help out with some of the disadvantages of sawing by the board foot. But, and I don't know a lot of people doing this, but I heard this several years ago in Georgia, and I thought it was a, kind of a good idea. You got a lot of, do a lot of small log sawing down there, and so what he did was he said, if, if I pull up to a job site, and I kind of explained to the guy ahead of time, I think, but you pull up there and he's got 80 logs to saw, and half of them are less than 12 inches in diameter, then he would charge a board foot fee plus a log fee. And uh, back then, this was like 10 years ago, if I had to guess, uh, I think he charged like $3 a log for any log that was less than 12 inches in diameter just because he couldn't get any production out of it. So if he sold 50 logs that day uh, that were under 12 inches, he would charge him $150 plus his board footage fee. Uh, I don't know if you could get away with that or do that in an area, but that was a method that I heard I thought was worth mentioning. Uh, the disadvantages are very similar to board foot, uh, too large or too small. Of course, you kind of help yourself uh, with the uh, log fee, but the extra trip and the losing jobs for those unfamiliar with board footage, those are all basically the same. You do get around a couple of them with the log fee, though. If you're in an area where you got huge logs and are really pushing the limits of the mill, you might want to charge a, a large log fee. Uh, so what that rate could be, I got $25 here, it could be $50. It uh, just depends on what you might want to do there. This is my uh, favorite way to charge, and it's called, I call it pricing by the board. And it's basically, uh, you're using your production or your board foot, but you're not having to explain the terminology of board foot, which I think is critical. 
like we said earlier, people are going to Lowe's, Menards, and they get in these packages, they get a printout that says, you need this many two by sixes, 16 foot long. For your rafters, you need this many uh, one by eights, 10 foot long or 12 foot long for your siding. They got the whole list right there and they tell them how much it is. Well, they call you up and a, with this system here, in a matter of minutes, you can literally say, here's how much it would cost for me to do it. Where if you're doing by the board foot, they're, they could be struggling with that terminology. Here's kind of what it looks like on a spreadsheet and you can do this on paper uh, or if you're computer savvy, you can certainly do it on the Excel spreadsheet and have a formula down here at the bottom if you want to charge 25 cents a foot or whatever your board footage charge is and it'll spit all that out for you. But across the side, down the side here, I have my dimensions, one by four, one by five, six, eight, 10, 11, up to 12, and then two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens, two by twelves. Across the top, then I got my length of board. I started eight foot, and if I have an LT40, I'd go to 20 foot. And uh, if you got a bed extension, you can go even longer than that. But what it does then, you can spit out and you say, if you want 25 cents a board foot, uh, you calculate how much board footage times 25 cents, and it throws that number in that square for you. So in just a matter of seconds, you can look at a two by six, 16 foot long, and I think it'll tell you it's five dollars and 60 cents. So you tell the guy, you want two by six is 16 foot long. They're 560 a piece for me to saw them. Times you want 100 of them. Okay, 560 times 100. You give him the price. Okay, what else you need? You want some one by tens or one by eights for your siding, 10 foot long. You put that, go over there, look at that number, how many of those you need, multiply that out. And in a matter of minutes, you can compare what it would cost him to buy his lumber versus what it cost him to have you saw it. So I think it's very effective in helping you get the job up front. I said you could put a formula down here, but when you talk to your customer, you don't even mention board footage. Now, if you go to a lumber yard and you want to buy, let's say, uh, a tuba tin. A tuba tin, 10 foot long, is $4.17 here for me to saw it for you. Uh, it might cost eight bucks at a lumber yard. But if you want a 20 foot tuba tin, then you're not talking $16. You're talking 25 or 30 bucks or, or whatever that number might be. They don't, it's not just double because it's twice the length. When you get into premium length lumber, then all of a sudden they charge a premium for it. And therefore, when you're sawing premium length lumber, because you have the capability of doing that, you can also charge a premium. So you don't have to stick, you may say anything over 16 foot, I want to charge 50 cents a board foot. And, put that, and you're not telling them 50 cents a foot, you're just telling them how much it is per board but that's your calculation. So you're kind of marching up your dollars uh, just like they do in a lumber yard. That makes sense? Any questions? Um, kind of did this one backward. Disadvantages would be the same as by the board foot. Your log size can hurt you. You may have to take an extra trip. Uh, consider the cutting location and the sawing technique. So same disadvantages of sawing by the board foot. Uh, but there's a lot of advantages to this method. Uh, pricing options, uh, another one is sawing on percentage of the value of the lumber produced. This is a little bit complicated but not that much. I'll try to explain it. Um, I had a customer several years ago from Missouri. Uh, he was a logger but he also had a sawmill and did sawing. So what he would do is go to the landowner themselves who had the timber and offer to, to log on a percentage, which was a common practice, still is today, but he also offered to saw the lumber on a percentage of the value that the lumber sold for. So it was a win, really a win-win situation. Now this was a hardwood uh, sawing technique that he did, but um, follow with me here. And this is not a, I couldn't even tell you, probably back in the old days, this was oak, I think. Obviously the market has changed dramatically, but let's just say an FAS board is worth $1,600 for a thousand. And a number one common board is worth $900 a thousand. That's going to be our basic premise. So what this guy did is he go to the landowner, 
and he said, I'll produce this lumber for you and you pay me a percentage of the value. So the way you, way you can look at this is if you're grade sawing, you, you, number one, if you're, if you're going to do this you, and you're in the grade lumber, you need to know how to grade saw, okay? But let's say you're grade sawing and you have a, a board in your, that you saw, initially saw it's nine inches wide, 12 foot in length. But that board is, it, at that size, is a number one common board, okay? If the guy would take the time to edge a knot or two off the edge of that board, it would become a FAS board, okay? So in this scenario, it was beneficial for him to take that one more inch off of that board and make it an FAS board, and here's why. Because if he got, let's say the percentages is, I get 25% for all FAS lumber I saw for you, sir. I get 22% for number one common and 20% for number two common. So in this scenario here, it was a nine inch board, it was number one common. So the value of that board is 90 cents a board foot. So 90 cents times nine board feet is $8.10. Now, if he takes it and makes it an eight inch board, it's less footage, but the value is greater because it's a dollar sixty a foot. So now the board value is twelve dollars and eighty cents. So the landowner gets twelve dollars and eighty cents for that FAS board, and the sawyer gets instead of a uh, dollar seventy eight if he'd left it a one by nine, he gets three dollars and twenty cents. It's a wonderful win-win operation. Now, what I'm telling all of you is if you're not a logger, don't go out and fell trees. It's extremely dangerous. But if you could hook up with a logger or just hook up with a landowner and make the deal via the logger, etc., it's a good it's a very good method. It's a win-win for you and a win-win for the customer. That's the different pricing options that I've seen and, and heard out in the field. Uh, Anybody got any questions or any different methods that they use for charging? Yes, sir. Should you charge by the time on the hour meter or by the time when you're actually at the job site? Well, I think that needs to be determined up ahead. I think most people charge by the time at the job site. Okay, the, the time on the hour meter typically would be an hour or so less than, than that, but you just need to calculate that in to whichever way you you want to do it. If you're charging by the hour on the mill, you better probably need to up your price a little bit. Good question. Anybody else? Uh, one of the things that's commonly asked in these is do you charge differently for one inch material versus two inch? And I think again that's a preference. Some guys do, most guys don't, but some guys will charge more if they're doing one inch versus the, the four, eight quarter they'll charge a little bit less. Okay. Anybody else got any questions? I appreciate your kind attendance. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and uh, thank you for coming. <laughs>